Okay, so this is just a very basic uh, talk about um, doing machine learning with scikit-learn. Uh, maybe there may be a follow-up talk depending on uh, interest, but uh, the talk mainly is going to focus on just the procedure of uh, training a model uh, using scikit-learn. So I'll just talk a little bit at the beginning about what machine learning is and stuff like that, just introduce the terminology, and then um, talk about the main workflow for uh, doing stuff with the scikit-learn, and um, then at the end, a few examples. So I was thinking it might be a good idea to start the talk actually with the bottom cell, ironically. So the bottom cell, I just wanted to mention um, there tends to be uh, two camps of uh, books uh, for uh, machine learning. Uh, on the one camp on the left, these are tend to be the hands-on uh, books. So uh, I'm just listing there the books that I sort of use and I found useful. Of course, there's hundreds uh, of books on uh, machine learning, but those are the ones that I've used uh, uh, over time. So um, there's this four on the left there, especially the, the top one, I would say, and the last one I found very useful. Uh, but they're all good. That's four to get sort of the practice. And they talk in um, general terms about what's inside these algorithms, but they tend to be relatively light uh, on the math. Now, if you want to know uh, really about the math that goes on inside these things, so I would say the four books on the right, that's the second camp, uh, they go over uh, the math. The, the math is generally undergrad uh, level. I mean, it's applied math, nothing really uh, difficult. Uh, but those books uh, on the right, uh, they really almost, there's absolutely no mention of uh, libraries, which one to use, or they don't go through any of that. They just cover the math. Uh, that's in the various uh, algorithms. So I'll be, the talk, I'll be focusing mainly, mainly at the level of the books on the left. Okay, so we're just going to go through the practice of training a model and we'll basically look at the libraries as black boxes, really. We won't go over the actual algorithm. But if you're interested, you can either look at the scikit-learn site or you can look at inside one of these books uh, on the right. They cover all of the hours. Okay, so with that out of the way. So um, what's machine learning? I'll talk a bit about that, and then we'll talk about the different categories of machine learning. So I'm just going to talk about supervised and unsupervised. I realize there's semi-supervised and reinforced learning and all that stuff I want talk about this, just the main main two ones that scikit-learn focuses on, in fact. And, um, and then we'll talk about what is scikit-learn. So how is data represented in, inside scikit-learn and the basic workflow. And we'll use the you know, popular IRIS data set that's in all of the books. And um, we will illustrate the workflow with a few algorithms on this uh, data set. Okay, so what's machine learning? Probably a good idea to answer this question is to try and ask what is uh, uh, data science? Of course, there's several definition of what uh, data science is. There is a famous um, uh, Venn diagram that you see on the web. Uh, by a person from that uh, community um, and shows what uh, data science is uh, as an intersection. So basically, if you want to be, according to this view, if you want to be really a data scientist, you need the computing skills here, some statistics and math, and you need to be in a field, say, climate or material science or whatever. So according to this view, Machine learning is, in fact, less demanding than data science. In other words, you don't really need to know a specific comes from a specific uh, field of science or engineering or whatever. You need 
to know the computing skills, you need to know Python and plotting and all of that stuff and pandas and all this stuff. And you need at least to have a general knowledge of statistics. And then uh, you can actually do machine learning, okay? Uh, it's a less uh, demanding, I think, task than being a real or full, full on uh, data scientist. So I think I tend to agree with that. I mean, machine learning, uh, especially with scikit-learn, I think as far as running the models and uh, doing all the stuff, tuning and uh, validating all that stuff, uh, maybe it's slightly more difficult than uh, plotting uh, uh, the mechanics of it. Not much. It's not really difficult. So uh, there's a more traditional view, uh, which says that basically you have to be a data scientist before you machine uh, learning. That's, I think, more the prevailing view in the sense that to be to do machine learning, you actually have to come also from a field uh, of science or so. Anyway, that's uh, at least a couple of views of uh, um, what uh, machine learning is. Um, so sometimes this is called uh, predictive analytics. Probably the best name I've seen is statistical learning. I think maybe that's what it should have been called. Uh, statistical learning. One of the books that I showed at the bottom, in fact, the title is Statistical Learning. So, but anyway, that's the name, machine learning. Okay, so what's the difference between uh, machine learning and the previous systems that preceded machine learning, which were supposed to be uh, intelligent systems, uh, decision-based, where they had rules? So a simple example would be if you're trying to design a spam filter, you can make out a list of words that are characteristics of spam emails and then write some script and say, if you find whatever, one, two, or three or more of these words in a, a message, just bin that message in a spam uh, folder. Uh, and what is the difference between that type of system and a machine learning. So well, the first system is basically based on in instructions. So if you look in, in here, this has to be custom designed for every test. So whether you're doing star classification, filtering out spam, whatever, you have to write something specific for uh, that task, okay? Whereas a machine uh, learning model, it doesn't care. If you pick an algorithm, you can feed it something about stars, you can feed it something about email, spams, uh, addresses, anything you want, identifying images or the, like the species of uh, uh, flowers or anything you want, you don't have to code. It's just one, one, one tool, you can feed it any data. Whereas in the first case, you have to be uh, custom write uh, code for every, for every task. Okay. Now, this second system, you basically have to it would be really complex to get it to work uh, well. Whereas in a machine learning model, you just have to care about choosing the, your parameters correctly, the hyperparameters of the model, making sure that the data contains its, you know, it's wide enough that it contains um, all of the features and things like that. And then the model will actually learn. Okay. So you don't need to. Uh, go and write extensive code to get the thing uh, to work, okay? You just need to make sure that the data is representative and then feed it into the model and it will um, basically find the pattern or the relationship. So another difference is that in a model, is very, machine learning is very easy to tune your model, okay? With your hyperparameters, you can change them or you can also tune it actually with the with your data set, you can add more features, you can add more samples and things like that. You can uh, tune your model. So when I say model here, I'm using it sometimes in a sloppy way, but model is strictly speaking algorithm plus data. That's the model. So uh, sometimes I'll say model just when I'm talking about the algorithm, but strictly speaking, it's the whole thing. Uh, anyway, so that's, that's the main differences. That's why, uh, these other systems, the older so supposedly intelligent systems, don't really work most of the time very well. Okay, and there's an example here that I found in one of the books, which is about image or human face perception. 
Okay, if you're trying to write a system to recognize faces in an image, as a programmer, you'll sit down and you'll say, okay, this thing has two eyebrows, two eyes, one mouth. You will try to write it the way you think an image looks like and the way you recognize it as a human. Whereas if you feed the pixels to a machine learning model, it will use a different approach to recognize face depending on the pixels and the properties of each pixel, okay? So that approach was successful, whereas the previous one uh, never went anywhere, uh, writing just code based on what a human being thinks a uh, face looks like. Anyway, so that's just to um, uh, talk about what uh, machine uh, learning is. Okay, so the learning in the machine learning is essentially just tuning the parameters of your model. So there's two sets of parameters here. There's hyperparameters, and those you have to choose at the beginning. I'll, I'll show that in a second. But then there is the actual parameters. Those are the degrees of freedom of your model. And that's what basically gets picked up during the fitting uh, as a way of finding the pattern or the relationship in, in the model. Okay, so it's the learning then occurs in basically finding values of these three parameters, which are in, in, in every model. Well, not exactly 100%, because that some models, like I'll talk about one nearest neighbors, that has no uh, parameters really. It's just an instance based model. It just stores your data and that's it. So there's nothing to tune in that model, but that's an exception. Most of the models will have. Okay, so um, with definition of machine learning out of the way, the two categories I'll uh, talk about very quickly are supervised and uh, unsupervised learning. So, and that's one of the things you want to determine early on if you want to choose machine learning to solve one of your problems. You need to try and think into which, which one of these categories your problem will fall. Is it supervised or unsupervised? The difference is that in supervised learning, basically you've got a, an input and an output, or if you like, you know, think of it as uh, questions and answers, the correct answers, of course. So that's the supervised learning uh, approach. Okay, so it's, um, if you can see here, it's the, most successful one because it's, it's um, again, it's supervised. You are actually providing the questions and the answers and the correct answers. So it's easy to test at the end how well your model is, uh, your trained model, how well it's doing, because you know what the answers are supposed to be. Uh, let's say you, you take a, a set, you can test it on a set where you know what the correct answers are and then compare and see how well the model does. So that one is easy to easy to validate and, and understand uh, conceptually it's uh, simple. Okay, so as I mentioned, you provide it with pairs and you need to allow it to find the relationship. The way it, this finding is or learning is basically it finds optimal values of the parameters in there. Okay, that's the ultimate uh, aim of the learning process now. One thing I should mention here is you need to make sure that you, your data set that you're providing does actually contain the pattern. Otherwise, you're wasting your time. So if there is no content information in your data set, it will not work. Okay. So one example I saw, which is uh, really nice in one of the books is assume you um, you have um, a table which contains the last names of people, their age, uh, their uh, addresses, residential addresses, um, anything else, their height, whatever, their weight, and all that stuff. And then uh, assume you try to predict the gender, okay? If you feed this information into a machine learning model, it will not work because there's simply no relationship between someone's last name, age, and things like that, and their gender. 
So even though you might have an extensive uh, data set, uh, the pattern is not there, okay? The, the information content is not there because there's not going to be a relationship between all these features and a person's age, okay? So something like that would be a waste of time. So so the, the data set you need to determine, and we'll, we'll show an example, you need to convince yourself ahead of time that a machine learning algorithm will actually have some success extracting the information there because the information is there in the first place, the pattern, I mean, or relationship, okay? So that's one thing to watch out for. Uh, yeah, that's a, the third point that I mentioned here. And again, you can uh, pred predict output for new inputs and see how well uh, you've done. Uh, one thing about uh, these uh, supervised learning is initially to train the model, you're going to have to collect the answers, the correct answers yourself, because you have to start somewhere. So there may be some uh, initial investment effort in you um, getting the correct answer so you can train the model. But after that, it's uh, it's pretty much uh, automated. Okay. And so there's two types of supervised learning. So there's, if the output is uh, discrete labels, as we'll see in the species classifications, okay, um, the, uh, that's a classification model because basically you have maybe two or more uh, labels, but they're specific. Okay, there's A, B, C, whatever. So your supervised learning is a classification uh, problem here. Uh, on the other hand, if you have um, something with continuous labels, like in the regression, uh, linear regression, simple linear regression, or the other ones where you have a whole range of, uh, of the axis, you know, so a whole range of, uh, of values uh, that can be you know, the Y, let's say, values, then that's, that's a regression model. So basically it's continuous output that's a regression. Discrete output, that's classification. Okay, the second type uh, we'll talk about is unsupervised learning. As you might guess, that's the one which does not contain the output. So in that case, you just basically have data, okay? And uh, there's no question and answer, it's just questions, basically. It's just uh, uh, features. So in, in that situation, you need to, tr and this one is more difficult, as you can imagine, because you don't really know what what you're trying to look for or, or trying to predict, okay, ahead of time. So there may be um, something, a pattern in the data, there may not be. Uh, whereas in supervised learning, you know that there are labels out there that you're trying to uh, predict. Here, you don't know. So that's uh, more difficult, as you might imagine. And um, so there's two types, and I'll show the um, first page of the cycle plan as a summary. But there's two types of that. There's clustering, where you've got the data and try to see somehow if it breaks up into some groups. Of course, you don't know ahead of time what's the distinguishing features of those groups, but you will find out if it does break up into groups. The other uh, division is uh, dimensionality reduction. So uh, I'll talk about that some more in a second, but that's basically uh, by dimensionality here, I, then I mean the number of features in, in your data set. So, uh, so let me talk about this in a second after I uh, talk about uh, a few more things. So this is the front page of the scikit-learn uh, site and you can see those are the uh, stuff we'll talk about this is supervised learning classification regression and the clustering and dimensional reduction um, this is uh, more things now this bit here we might talk about next time if there is interest that's across validation and then things like overfitting, underfitting, bias and various and all that stuff. And this pre-processing, so this I won't talk about much. This is just basically how to do, uh, to prepare your uh, data set. Uh, anyway, so what's um, scikit-learn? So probably the most popular 
uh, uh, Python library for uh, machine learning, uh, open source, constant development, algorithm are presumably very efficient. Um, uh, documentation is uh, pretty good, I think, compared to some other uh, packages I've seen. Uh, just a couple of things from my own personal experience uh, to watch out for because it's under constant development. Some of the examples you might find in tutorials, in uh, books or whatever, after a while, you might find that some of them don't run anymore because they do keep moving um, things around, giving them new names, the packages, the classes, and things like that. So watch out. Sometimes uh, I come across many examples, even dating just two years from two years back that uh, don't work anymore. So you have to find the equivalent uh, module or class. Or, uh, in uh, the other thing is that uh, documentation, because I guess it's a community effort, you will run into, I've seen already a few equations with uh, um, missing terms or uh, wrong uh, indices and things like that. They're not all typos. I mean, they're just uh, real errors. in uh, uh, And sometimes uh, wrong things are stated in the documentation. But I think that's probably due uh, to the fact that so many people contribute to the documentation, so it's bound, bound to happen. So I usually... Uh, refer to uh, the books uh, that I mentioned uh, before. Okay, so that's what scikit-learn is. So now to mechanics of running something. Uh, scikit-learn expects uh, the data to be in this form. You need a feature matrix, which contains n samples. So the by sample, I mean just data points. Okay, sometimes it's called record. Okay, so if this was, as we'll see, if this was the measurements of dimensions of a flower, and this here, the target is the species of that flower, every flower would be just correspond to one line. These would be the dimensions in here, and every flower in your data set would have a single line. Those would be the n samples. And those are the n features, the number of different properties, basically, for every point in there. And that's the output, in case you have labeled uh, set. Okay. The important point in um, to note here is this is always expected to be in a matrix. So even if you have a single feature per, per point, per record, or sample, you still have to reshape it into a matrix. Okay. It won't take it as a one dimension. You'll, you'll get an, an error. So you need to just either introduce a new axis with the NP new axis or reshape it into a matrix, even if it contains a single uh, element per line. Okay. So that's one thing you need to do is, you know, assuming you got your uh, data set ready, you clean it, you take care of missing point, all that, all that uh, data range and stuff. But make sure then uh, you have it in this form, a matrix and a vector uh, for labels. Okay, so this is the basic workflow. It's fairly easy. Okay, after you've done the, the data cleanup and all that stuff and decided, uh, I won't go through this, just decided which algorithm is best for you to start with and you know how to frame your problem and all of that stuff. I call that pre-processing. Basically, some of that stuff is on my scikit-learn page. I showed you the, the pre-processing part. Some of it is there. Uh, anyway, so you need to now decide on algorithm, which one you want. Now, every algorithm in scikit-learn is implemented as a Python class. So once you decide which algorithm you want, you import the class corresponding to that algorithm. That's the first step, OK? Then we'll go through explicit examples. But then you basically create an object of this class, instantiate it. And at this stage is when you get a chance to uh, customize, if you like, your algorithm. So you choose the hyperparameters. Those are very different from the actual parameters that will be there. So those you actually select at the time you instantiate your class. So could be 
I'll show some some examples, but that's the stage where you choose. Some algorithms don't have any hyperparameters. Others have tons of them. So maybe a, as a starter, just accept the defaults in, in most cases. Maybe just pick one or two and accept the defaults for the other. Okay. Once you've uh, uh, created an object of a class, that's the one you're going to use uh, for fitting later on the objects through. So methods of the object will allow you to do everything you want. Now, in case of supervised learning, we'll show in a second, you want to split your data into part of it is training. Usually it's like 75%, I think, default uh, to train, and the other one to test because you already know what the correct answers are in your initial data set. So don't use the whole one. Just take 75, say, percent of it for training your model and the other 25% for testing. Okay, so next time, if there is a next time, we can talk about how to use different parts. That's just process validation, how to use different parts to test. But for now, assuming you're just doing one split, 75% training, let's say, 25% uh, for testing. Uh, so um, in that features matrix, we'll, we'll show how you can split it into together targets. Okay. Uh, and then you fit your model. So that's through the fit method. So this is basically where everything happens. Uh, the whole thing will run, and presumably it will come up with these uh, good values for the parameters of the model. So the simple example to think of is uh, a simple linear regression. Okay, it will it will learn if you like the slope and the intercept. Okay. That's that's a very sim the simplest one uh, I can think of. Okay, and then uh, you can predict and try and validate. Uh, okay, so I'm not sure how we're doing on time, but uh, let's let's do a look at an example of the official uh, iris uh, data set. That's uh, in every book, everywhere you find this data set. So you can import that from the scikit-learn, but it also comes inside Seaborn. Uh, difference is inside Seaborn, it's a pandas data frame. In uh, scikit-learn, I think it's a bunch object or something. It's similar. Uh, you get a table. So I just uh, uh, import Seaborn and grab the iris data set. And as you can see, this is a set that you can definitely run supervised learning on. You've got, uh, these are the samples, one, two, three, okay. You've got all uh, 150 samples, four features per sample. So that's um, just to show you, I grabbed this picture. That's the sepal and the petal for every iris flower. And so here you get the length, width, length, width, and that gives you the correct uh, species. So this stuff has to be basically done manually. You need to uh, invest an effort, effort in doing it, and then you can train the model. Okay, so that's the, the iris data set. Okay, so um, here, just make this a bit smaller. So if you display now, when we say this set is four dimensional, we mean it has four features per sample. Okay, so feature space is four dimension. Okay, now we talked initially about wanting to decide whether your uh, data set contains a relationship already. So, is there a chance that a model trained on this data set is going to be successful in predicting the species? So. Ideally, you'd want to look in four-dimensional feature space. Okay? If you look inside four-dimensional, of course, it cannot be done in practice, but ideally, if you're able to visualize things in four-dimensional feature space, then you should be able to see the species corresponding um, to the different points in that four-dimensional feature space occupying different regions. Okay? So... Um, why? Because then you know that just based on the features, you can distinguish the species, okay? If uh, these species were all 
on top of each other in four dimensional feature space, then it's hopeless. There is no pattern. So it's a waste of time to try and train a model on that because by themselves, the features are not able to tell one species from another. Okay. Since we can't look in uh, four dimensional feature space, there's two options. Either you can look in a pair plot. So look at one, in other words, take two axes at a time. Okay. So you look at the features two axes at a time. Okay. Or you can use dimensional reduction from the uh, unsupervised learning. Okay. This is the first option. If you take two axes at a time, okay, ignore the diagonal ones. Just uh, petal, sepal, and um, petal length here, width length. Okay. So if you look just two axes at a time, you can see that there is a pattern. Okay. In other words, the values for the features are separated. Okay. For every species. Okay. If those things were on top of each other in every panel here, then this, this cannot be used to train a model. It's a waste of time. But based on these values, you can tell, right? The blue here are in the side here. Those are in the middle. That's on the top. So a machine learning model, you can have some confidence at the outset that based on the features okay, that you have in there, it should be able to tell one species from another, okay? Because they're separate in uh, feature space. Okay. okay, so now just the, remember, you have to cast your data in a specific form. Uh, that's what uh, scikit-learn uh, expects. So I'll grab just the features, put them in a X features matrix here, and I'll drop the species and the other stuff. And yeah, so all I did, and then I did the target here. That's just the, the panda series, just a single column which expects the the answers or your labels. In this case, we have only three labels. Okay, and since this is a supervised learning here, we'll split uh, the data. So you want to import this uh, function, train test split. And you run it on the features matrix and the target. And this thing is just so that you can get, uh, you can repeat the results, get the same answer every time. This controls just the shuffling of the data. So the data set is taken, gets shuffled, and then gets split 75, 25, I think is the default. Okay, so that's after it's split. You have the stuff that you're going to use to train, and then the stuff that you're going to use to test. Okay, this is just showing you basically what you get. <clears throat> All right. So, um, yeah. So that's now you're ready. You have your data set ready. I'll show a few quick examples of how we run that. Um. Sorry, Ronzi, we're running quite a bit late. And okay, we if you want. I mean, we have issues. So yeah, this might be a good time. Next time. Yeah, yeah, this might be a good time to stop. So next time we can run some examples. And if there's any interest, uh, we can do uh, more of the um, other topics.